Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Deandra Coleman, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, Virginia SBDC is a partnership program between the U.S. Small Business Administration, George Mason University, and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Today's webinar, Digital Marketing and Technology for the Future, is presented by the Alexandria SBDC and hosted by the Virginia SBDC Network. Be sure to check out the next webinar in the series, Supply Chain Impacts and Considerations. That one's gonna be on June 23rd. We are recording today's presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted. But if you have questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today's session. Ray Sidney Smith, President and CEO of W3 Consulting and Managing Director of W3C Web Services, is the author of Solomo Success, Social Media, Local and Mobile Web Small Business Marketing Strategy Explained, and Podcasting for Small Business, Ray is the Google Small Business Advisor for Productivity, WhoSuite Global Brand Ambassador, and Evernote Regional Leader for North America. Ray also hosts the weekly podcast, Web and Beyondcast, discussing small business marketing and management on the web and beyond and interviewing small business experts, as well as hosts a weekly video live stream show, Web and Beyond Live, covering more timely news related to the small business digital marketing landscape. Please join me, everyone, in welcoming our presenter for today, Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Deandra. Uh, so as Deandra said, I'm Ray Sidney Smith. I'm the president of W3 Consulting, and I am pleased to be here uh, on behalf of the Alexandria SBDC and as well the Virginia SBDC to talk to you today about digital marketing and technology trends. And so today's agenda is actually fairly simple. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about some of the technology trends that are both short term and long term that can help you understand where things are going so that you're able to better plan your small business marketing and really operations plans for the future. And we will then go into predominantly the digital marketing trends so that you can see really what's going on in the digital marketing landscape. Uh, we will then kick into some tools you can use so that you can understand some of the tools that will help making these kinds of planning strategic you know, implementations a little bit easier for you. And uh, and so you can know that you can actually make some of these things happening uh, happen. Some of these technologies seem to be complicated, uh, but at the same time, there are more and more tools coming onto the pike that allow us to be able to create them very easily. Uh, we'll have some time at the end for Q&A, and then we will uh, answer those questions and then close out. And so a fairly easy uh, agenda for us today. I wanted to start off our discussion today with regard to where we are with regard to some baseline trends. What you're seeing on screen right now is actually a a, a chart of, of you know the United States showing a uh, uh, the population of freelancers and the amount of freelancers that are out there uh, in 2020. And so Fiverr. And in, in partnership with Rockbridge Consulting has been for the past four years, at least collecting all of this data, looking at tax returns and under, trying to understand how many freelancers are out there in the world. And, you know, freelancing is a kind of solopreneurship. And this helps us to understand a little bit about what's going on in some of the baseline trends related to not just small business entrepreneurship, but also technology. And so what Fiverr is, is a platform for freelancers to be able to come and do creative, technical, and professional work for people, uh, mostly probably businesses like yourself who are hiring freelancers to do that kind of work. Some of you may be those freelancers as well. Uh, but what we know is that between 2011 and 2020, there has been a 20% uh, increase pretty much across the board in terms of the number of freelancers that have come online in that time frame. And actually, if, if I can pop out of here just for one moment, um, we can actually see here 
in the live graph, some really interesting information here. So we can look between population and we can look at revenues and we can see that the, the not only the dispersion of, of people in major metropolitan areas has has grown, uh, the same places seem to tend, you know, seem to be consistent in terms of how it's all working out. But what I'm what I'm mostly interested in in this particular category is the fact that we have had this this really remarkable growth. We're going from uh, $19 billion in 2011. Uh, now we're at $26 billion, just if we look at New York City alone. So the amount of dollars pouring into the freelance market just continues to grow. And so we have to be mindful of that as we start to make our plans for what we're going to be doing going forward. This is in confluence with the fact that 4 million people quit their jobs in April. Uh, that is that that's a group of people who basically said, I decided that I'm confident in the job market enough that I don't want at, I don't want to work for you, <laughs> you know, and uh, that's a, a remarkable and amazing uh, statistic. And we're going to see more and more of this, especially as more businesses decide that employees have to come back into the office and they're them not wanting to do so. And we're going to see a kind of a reckoning with regard to a lot of these different social and technological components here. People showed that they could do their work in a hybrid and remote environment, and they're going to want that flexibility going forward. And we're going to see that. And that's going to, of course, be something that's going to be difficult for small business owners to deal with as we see more and more people want the flexibility in their work environment and small business owners trying to keep their operations running because they need people to staff their retail offices and retail stores. Another really interesting statistic that I consistently am paying attention to is that we're seeing retail e-commerce sales grow from 2012 here showing on, on screen to 2021 from the US Census Bureau's data. We see that quarterly retail sales have basically grown 200% over that time frame, And while they've, you know, they've basically doubled, uh, you know, every five years, the reality is, is that it represents still only 15% of total retail sales. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me that retail sales are always going to be something where people want to spend time physically with a product that they're going to purchase, and they're much more likely to do that. But as the trend line shows, it's just going to get higher and higher. It's not going to all of a sudden precipitously go down. So e-commerce is going to start eating up more and more retail sales. And businesses who are not preparing themselves for this are going to, of course, have trouble with that. And that's notwithstanding the pandemic. I really think that people misunderstand the trend line here, which is that more people are going to mobile, more people are doing e-commerce, and therefore, we're going to get more and more e-commerce, period, and then more mobile e -co mobile commerce, period. Uh, something that I find interesting here is that if we look at the, the data from Statista here, we can see that the trend line again shows us that retail e-commerce continues to grow. Uh, this is showing only from 2017 to 2024. And so it's projecting a little bit out what it's what and how it's going to grow. And these are in millions of dollars. So we're talking, you know, roughly about half a billion dollars uh, in today's uh, in today's dollars, and almost 600, you know, 550, 560 billion dollars uh, come 2025. Uh, the thing that I frequently have to pay attention to here, though, and I point out to you, is that if we look at the numbers, um, and look at the notes here. That's why I screenshotted this this way. So if you look at this, the the notes here, it says this is only for physical goods, sale of physical goods via e-commerce. So we're not talking about anything in terms of digital goods, uh, digital sales. All of that stuff is left out of these numbers, which means there are hundreds of billions of dollars not represented in retail e-commerce because it's only showing those physical goods that are that are transacting online today. So be mindful of the fact that the market is so much bigger and the opportunity is so much bigger when we take that into account. Now, as I noted before, we have a couple of other trend lines, which is that if we go from 2008 to 2021, so roughly a 20 year span, we see that the uh, the number of US adults who own a laptop or a computer 
of some kind has pretty much stayed stable, right? It's right around the 75% mark. Uh, but what we can see here is that more and more people are purchasing tablet computers. Uh, those are things like iPads and uh, you know Android tablets and Chrome OS tablets and that kind of thing. And so we can see that trend line a little bit has tapered off there. You can see that from 2018 to 2021, we see a little bit of tapering off there. It says 2019, I suppose. So some 2000, uh, 18 to 2019, this seems a little bit of tapering off. But what we will see is that when this is Pew Research data, when Pew Research puts out their final data, you'll see that number has, has probably ticked up remarkably because of the last year and a half. And what we're going to see then is that because more people have tried a tablet, they have experienced a positive, uh, you know, positive computing experience with it, they're going to then uh, increase their purchase of the purchases of those over time. And we'll see that trend line for computers diminish just a little bit. It probably won't go very, very much further off the 75% mark, but we'll see that the tablet computer market will certainly continue to compete, especially as the younger generation starts utilizing tablet computers because they're very similar to their smartphones. They grew up with their smartphones, and so they're much more likely to continue utilizing mobile technologies over their desktop technologies. This comes in line with the fact that mobile mobile phone ownership is at record highs, and we will only see this increase. 95% uh, of Americans uh, have some kind of mobile uh, phone, whether that be a cell phone or otherwise. We're we're really at, uh, you know, like uh, it's not peak because you know peak is having more than one cell phone per per a U.S. adult, but right now. Uh, the number of U.S. adults who have a, have a device is nearing that full saturation point where almost everybody has one. So uh, that's uh, baseline. More and more people are getting smartphones. Think of a smartphone as a computer in your pocket. And so once we have more people who own smartphones than cell phones, we're going to certainly see the reality factor here that the the market will change toward more people buying and more people just transacting business generally on their phones because they have the capability of doing so. We're also seeing a software, a software maturation happening out there, which is that more and more software developers like Apple and Google are out there creating software platforms that allow for the same experience and the same feature set to happen on the mobile device as much as on the desktop. So. Whereas once upon a time, I had to go to my computer to do something. If I don't have to go to my computer because I can do it now on my phone, that gives me a greater, uh, you know, just efficiency to be able to go ahead and do that right where I am when I want to. This also comes in line with just one final piece of, of data that I think is really important for us all to understand is that digital disruption is a real thing. And as we make our way through, we have to understand that different sectors are experiencing different forms of digital disruption. And so things like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and NFTs are going to affect a different sector of the markets than say, just basic dynamic pricing or other kinds of e-commerce disruption in the, in the markets. This is based on regulatory issues and regulatory concerns, but it also is because of consumer demand. And what we see here is BCG, the Boston Consulting Group, put together this really good uh, self-reported potential for disruption and transformation in the digital space uh, chart. And the report itself shows these different industries. And what you have to be aware of is like where you are in your industry in this particular space and determine whether or not you're ahead of that curve. So are you more likely or less likely to be disrupted? And therefore, are you more likely to adopt more technology now so that you can stay ahead of your industry and therefore stay positive in your consumer's eyes? So. Uh, also understand that you have to take data privacy and security into, into perspective here when you do any level of digital disruption or transformation work. So always keep that in mind as you make your way forward in these changes. So we see all of this data going on. And what it really tells us is that there are, is a, a clear change, adaptation that's happening. And we saw this even during the pandemic and it accelerated. But the point that I love to make about the uh, the pandemic itself was that it helped to underlie or underline a very specific point that I have been making for probably the past decade, which is that SMBs who had online sales 
they reported a higher share of digital sales overall during the pandemic, notwithstanding the issues of the pandemic. That being the case, those people who had websites, those people that had the ability to take money from their customers online, hence e-commerce, were all basically better off than their competitors, than their peers in the marketplace even during the pandemic. Uh, this comes out of the global state of small business report that Facebook put together uh, for 2020. And, uh, and so uh, these are all, by the way, linked in the slides. So you can uh, hop back to this and look at it. This has a lot of really good and interesting information in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the global uh, state of small business report. But the, the through line that we can see from all of this data are a couple of things. One is that people are going to have more technology in their hands on a day-to-day -day basis. More people, more technology. And that means in developing countries, but if we're just focused on the US, we're, we're getting near that saturation point where everybody will have a phone, everybody will have access to the internet uh, by their phone and therefore have access to the World Wide Web, which means that they will have more buying opportunity and will want to have more convenience to do those things online. Two is that uh, with that uh, reality factor, um, no matter where you are in the market, whether you're worried about being disrupted by a, cons a competitor or not, you are going to see more and more resilience in the market if you diversify both between offline and traditional sales and online or e-commerce. Certainly for awareness, small business awareness, where the company is trying to be found, uh, you absolutely need to have some kind of web presence in order to stabilize in that sense. So very much make, pay attention to the fact that we're going mobile, uh, you know, people are buying online and they will continue to increase buying, uh, their buying habits online. And when people research online, they tend to also buy online, uh, not, not, you know, as a majority, probably about the 43% mark, but we do know that people are buying online and when they're given the opportunity to do it, they will. So with a little bit of data kind of under our belt, I wanted to walk us through some of the marketing trends that then can help us understand what's going on. So, you know, right now we're roughly at around a $5 trillion mark um, in 2021 for e-commerce sales to be projected by the end of this year. And, um, and that includes all of the digital you know, goods and, and as well as physical goods number. And so let's walk through these pieces. Now, uh, I will note that I'm covering just a glimmer of all of these marketing trends in this slide has many, many more. And so I'm just covering the ones I can cover during our time that we have together today. So I'm going to run through these and we will go from there. My first one is actually a snap back to the past, which is to say that um, direct mail that is physical mail marketing is alive and well. And a lot of people uh, have kind of discounted that and have forgotten that we still have a US Postal Service <laughs> and it works and uh, you know it's embattled, but it works. And uh, remarkably though, um, the people who receive direct mail, they are 28% more likely to purchase and they are also 28% more likely to spend more money um, from direct mail marketing. So our, the data really shows that direct mail marketing is a great investment right now because most people are doing email marketing. Most people are doing ads. Most people are trying to do SEO and content marketing and physical mail has just kind of been left out. And so if you're if you have the budget and you, you are thinking about a, a touch point to be able to bring people into a physical space, uh, direct mail marketing is actually something that you should be considering. Uh, but that notwithstanding, we then snap back to digital and the most powerful digital uh, you know, platform that you can possibly have for your business uh, now and probably into the near decade, maybe even more than that, is your email marketing list. Email marketing still has the highest ROI for every dollar you put into email marketing, you get out 42, something like that. And so remember that if you are not and are not commanding an email list, you are doing yourself a disservice. And so this is one of those perennial marketing trend lines that I've seen over time 
that I will continue to keep beating the drum over everyone's head about, which is that if you do not have an email list, then somebody else owns your relationship with your client, uh, with your potential customers and otherwise. You need to make sure that you are controlling the communication channel between them. Now, there's a minor uh, variant on this, which could be SMS, so phone numbers, as well are useful in this regard. Addresses, obviously, if you're doing direct mail is also important here. But email marketing is the fastest, most efficient way to get in touch with people one-to-one. -one. You control that email list, you're capable of communicating with them. So make sure that you are paying attention to your email marketing in and along with all of these other digital marketing trends. Next up is the Google My Business. And Google My Business is really important for local search, but it's becoming more and more per important for really all search that's out there for businesses. And the reason for that is Google has centralized many of its pieces of the SEO kind of ecosystem for businesses by utilizing your listing on Google My Business. The idea here is that the number one rank criteria for people finding your business is usually your vicinity to them. So if I'm a user and I'm looking for a local dentist, I'm going to type in dentist near me or, you know, something to that effect. We, we use stores near me, you know, dentists near me, whatever the service is, restaurants near me. We're going to find things based on vicinity first. That's always going to be the top tier ranking factor. But just beyond that then are things like reviews, completeness of the listing so that we know what hours of operations uh, are going on, correct information and consistent data across your Google My Business listing. Now remember that Google My Business collects reviews not just from those that people submit on Google. They are also looking at Facebook reviews. They're looking for on-site reviews, making sure that your schema data is up to date, Yelp, TripAdvisor, and others. So those are all sources for Google. So make sure that you are across the board, making sure that you're getting good reviews and handling those re reviews effectively. I'm seeing more and more businesses who are letting their Google My Business listings languish and then being severely impacted after the fact. So just make sure that you are handling them and keeping them up to date and also sourcing new reviews. You just can't let this one go. You can't say, oh, well, we've got five, you know, reviews on our site and we're just going to, you know, stop asking people. You need to be consistently, consistently asking people for new reviews over, over time to do that. Continuing on with Google and the search engines, understand that we are in a period where Google is going through and making sure that their page experience algorithm is being updated so that they are looking at how users are enjoying their time on websites. And they are giving preference to people based on that enjoyment. And so they've decided to start implementing what they call Core Web Vitals. Core Web Vitals is three different ranking factors that basically tells Google that when people show up on your website, they're gonna have a good experience. That is that things are gonna load fast, that you're gonna be able to do what you wanted to do very quickly, and that things aren't gonna shift around too much when you look at the page. Uh, all of those things just tend to be things that Google really doesn't like uh, your website to do, but that's purely because these are things that users have shown Google through the data that they collect is, a, is, is disrupting people from having a good page experience. Now, this is actually quite practical and has, it doesn't really change much about the fact of the matter um, in terms of, of how, do, how do you think about it? Like, if your website is a bad experience, right, if it looks like some 1990s you know, disaster, <laughs> um, you know, your core web vitals is probably already not great and you're probably all not, you're not ranking. So if you haven't redone your website in the past 15, 20 years, now's the time to do that. If you have started your website probably in the last five years, core web vitals has already been a factor for whether people have been buying from you or not. So upgrading core web vitals, that is, your load time, your interactivity, first time to in interact with those pages, and of course, uh, making sure that your visual layout is stable when someone shows up. You don't want you know things moving around when people are trying to click on buttons on your page. Those are all things that you want your site to do anyway well. That's just good coding, it's just good hosting, that kind of thing. So make sure that you have your core web vitals. This is coming out uh, starting mid-June, so we will start to see websites ranking 
uh, better or worse based on Core Web, web Vitals, starting them in June, and they're going to start rolling it out. But just make sure that you are paying attention. There are tools for being able to, to identify whether your website is doing well with this, and I have links to these in the slides. So you can check your website, make sure it's up to date in that regard. So if we continue on in that space of search engines, we are uh, making sure that we're being found by Google and being sourced from Google to our websites. And at that point, when people are on our websites, what we are no noting is that the next big trend line is in what we call personalization. And so when I, that, when I show up at your website, what I want to be able to be done is for it to recognize me in some way, shape, or form. Not necessarily in a creepy way, but in a way that tells me that you understand me and you know me as a buyer. And so personalization is that next big marketing trend that I, that I want you to really be paying attention to. In this sense, what we're really talking about is not necessarily high tech. It is really the idea of making sure that when I come to your site, you have told me that you understand me as a customer. So yes, that could mean that you collect some data about me. And therefore, when I show up at your website, you can say, hi, Ray, how are you doing today? Do you want to buy another, you know, set of black shoes that you bought the last time you showed up. You can do that kind of technological investment. But what I care about much more is that you actually guide me so that when I show up as a customer on your website, you actually help me self-select into a group of people that I'm like so that you can then start talking to me specifically. So for example, sample, if you are selling uh, you know, cars and if you're a car dealership and you sell to just consumers, right, everyday drivers, and or to uh, businesses in the commercial fleet space, well, then you have two different areas or buckets of personalization. When I show up to your website, you should have two big images or two big buttons. One that says, you know, see our set of, you know, normal vehicles. And the other that says, hey, here goes all of our fleet vehicles that you can buy in mass for your fleet. If you need to buy 25 vehicles today, this is, you show me an image of me as a business owner who needs to buy that volume of vehicles and have fleet management and all those other things involved in it, right? The two different consumers are clearly different. And what we shouldn't do is try to mix that conversation into one space. So your website actually becomes this much more uh, split and multiple website within a website kind of environment, right? So I come to your website, I should be able to self-select into a group and then be able to experience that information so that I'm able to understand that you understand me and my needs, right? If I'm a, if I'm a consumer, my needs and my wants are very different than my needs or wants as a fleet manager of a bunch of vehicles. And so personalization can be done in that very, very clear way, right? If you're speaking to an audience, make sure that once they show up on your website, that they are uh, uh, sectioned off, cordoned off, you know, facilitated, guided into those into those places. Think of it from a retail experience. When you walk into a retail store, a clerk will address you. Hi, how's it going? You know, how are you doing today? Uh, did you come here for a particular reason? Is there something that you're looking for? That kind of thing. They'll try to engage you in a conversation. The reason for that is that if they can lead you to the aisle and the location of the product you already are looking for, that's going to mean that you're that much closer to getting your felt need or want satisfied. And that means you're closer to the sale. And the same thing needs to happen on the website. So much of websites today are just portfolios. They're just brochures about the business as opposed to being a facilitated experience walk me through how I can buy from you. If you walk me through that process, I'm much more likely to buy. And so personalization is very, very important and powerful. In that process, or in that kind of vein of thinking, we can then start to think about how live chat and bots can work. Uh, this is going to bring up a very heady topic, what we call um, artificial intelligence or machine learning. And this is a huge marketing trend that we have to start embracing as small businesses. So. I'm going to use this example of live chats and bots, but know that this is AI or machine learning is a much, much bigger topic that touches almost every part of your business, as we'll, we'll talk about shortly. But the idea here is that you can actually use machine learning or artificial intelligence in this case to be able to create all kinds of interactions with people and personalize their experience when they show up on their website. So for example, if we go back to that prior slide, I show up on the website, you know, if I'm doing nothing and then it says, hi, Ray, how are you? That little pop-up on the screen is going to tell me that you 
you care, that you have the ability to interact with me. All of those kinds of things are gonna be positive for me. And so what I'm gonna be able to do now is I'm gonna be able to say in the little chat box, yeah, sure, I would like to, you know, buy some new shoes today. And then you can say, okay, well, are you looking for loafers? Are you looking for, uh, you know, um, boots? Are you looking for other types of shoes? And if you can answer those questions for me and lead me to the page, it's just like that clerk in the physical store who's talking to me and saying, oh yeah, sure, we have that in the store today. Uh, if you come over to this aisle, let me show you uh, what you can what you can browse and see what, what fits you. And if you need a size, I can go ahead and bring a size out for you. That's the kind of thing that live chat and bots do for us today. Now, of course, live chat, meaning that there is a uh, human or a machine that is capable of being interactive with the customer. Bots are one way to do this, which is in essence, a facilitated conversation that provides resources or links to product pages, those kinds of things that can also handle customer service. But just know that in the personalization space, live chat and bots are really, really important. Know that we have a whole bunch of options here when it comes to live chat and bots, including Facebook themselves, they have Messenger, which you can implement on your own website. So your Facebook page then gets tied to your website. And so someone can click on that little lightning bolt chat icon and open up a conversation and be facilitated in a live or semi-live chat conversation with you. Uh, there's WhatsApp and there's Viber and Telegram and many others that can be automated in this sense. And so just know that there is technology out there that makes it very easy for you to be able to set up a conversation flow. And so when people ask certain questions, they will get particular answers. And so this level of automation utilizing AI is going to become a huge part of our business going forward. And it's so it's important for businesses to start understanding how artificial intelligence works and the various tools that are out there. So tools like ManyBot gives us the ability to add this bot technology to our website. We don't need to know coding or anything like that, but it gives us the ability to go ahead and hop into our website add a technology like ManyBot that will that will put a chat functionality on our website. And now customers, when they come at three o'clock in the morning looking for something on our website, they will get something that interacts with them so that they are not just left, you know, standing there, uh, you know, to look around the website. They're actually being facilitated toward what they're looking for and they're much more likely to buy than they would if they just were left to their own devices. Now, continuing in the AI space, there is this burgeoning field of, of technology that is known as dynamic pricing. And dynamic pricing means that when you're on your website, if, you're, if you have an e-commerce site specifically, you're basically in competition with all of the major e-commerce sites out there, whether that be Amazon, Walmart, Target, Best Buy, you name it. All of those sites basically have very fancy software that goes around and looks at the prices of its competitors. It looks at its own ongoing sales. It looks at what is in stock, what's in inventory, and what items are actually being sold on the site. And based on that, it goes ahead and uh, decides on, on what the price of any particular item should be. So at this point, you then have the ability to uh, increase price, lower price, those kinds of things based on what's happening in the space. And this is of course very, very powerful. And there are technologies that allow you to be able to make that happen. So if you were doing any level of e-commerce, it's something that you probably want to start thinking about because even if you were not doing it, your competition is. And if your competition is doing it, uh, I know that, you know, certainly if you have a Shopify website and uh, and you integrate with certain tools uh, like PriceSync, it's just doing it for you, you know? So it's very easy now. It's very capable of being put into place. And that means your competition can make this happen. And that means you're gonna lose out on sales. Um, going forward, just a quick note about advertising. One is that we continue to see more and more businesses spending money on advertising, both on, on the digital side, which is like Google and Bing advertising, but also in the social space. And I continue to uh, say that we really need to think about this from the AI and machine learning perspective by utilizing something called programmatic advertising. 
That is to say that you as a small business owner, I know I as a small business owner, if I didn't actually help businesses run ads, I would have no clue how to actually put together effective advertising campaigns. And I bet that you probably don't either. And so we need to go to utilizing the automated functionalities of things like AI, which is kind of what the term programmatic advertising means in, in, in all aspects of our business. Because the reality is, is that programmatic, basically what it does is it goes out there and it looks at all the platforms. Right, so think uh, Hulu, Pinterest, Google Ads, LinkedIn, Twitter, Snapchat, TikTok. It looks at all of them and it makes the decision on how to display your ads to those people for how long, for how much money to bid for, all of that stuff. It makes all of those calculations in a split instant and then spreads the ads so that it makes the most money for you in terms of driving traffic to your website, driving your traffic to, to lead pages and ultimately to convertible pages like a shopping cart or checkout page. So programmatic advertising really is the future of advertising for small business uh, if we pay attention to the fact that we really just don't want to spend the time and energy doing that. Now, the, the, the unfortunate part about that is that it can seem like a black box, right? You're putting dollars in, but you're not quite sure what is happening inside on the other side of that. So remember that whatever programmatic advertising platform you choose, whether that's be matched to one or another of those platforms, you need to make sure you trust those parties, because if you trust those parties, then you'll feel like you're getting the results on the other side. But if you don't trust those parties, it's because they're probably misusing your funds. They are collecting or skimming money, you know, too much money off the top. Of course, they have to make money, so they have to charge you something. But, you know, they, they may be taking a little bit too much money, more than you think it is um, supposed to cost, those types of things. So just be mindful that programmatic advertising does require trust in the platform that is doing that level of work. And then, of course, the quality of the algorithm, the artificial intelligence is an algorithm. It's code. It's software. So you have to trust that their algorithm is as good as the others that are out there. All right, moving right along, we then have social commerce. And what we're coming out uh, in terms of the social space uh, from the advertising space is that we now have e-commerce doing really well and growing. And what we're seeing is now <laughs> we have social networks wanting to get in on the goods, right? They understand that if they can start getting in between uh, the cust consumer and the business, just like advertising platforms do, they can make some money. And so Facebook and uh, Twitter and Google and all of them, Apple, they're all working on the process of utilizing their social technologies to be able to start collecting money. Uh, Apple has just impl implemented Apple podcast subscriptions, getting the ability to take some money um, out of the podcasting ecosystem. Uh, Facebook has launched Facebook shops for both Facebook and Instagram. So now people can sell products directly on Facebook. They can actually uh, sell events and charge for events on Facebook and Instagram. Twitter now has tip jar. Uh, they're going to be rolling out new technology soon that will allow you to be able to charge for events that you're hosting on Twitter. Uh, Google has Google Pay and they are working uh, with the Chrome product to be able to bring more and more e-commerce solutions, not only to Chrome, but also to Gmail, where you'll be able to actually interact and make purchase intent choices directly from within Gmail. Everywhere you see your interactions of consumers, you're going to see more and more social starting to put their toe into the water of social commerce. So start to think about whether or not this makes sense for you. For me, I'm still on the side that social media and social networks should be for engaging consumers. They shouldn't be for selling to consumers. You should be directing people to your website so you can control you can, can control the, those interactions and that uh, that relationship, right? Because quite honestly, I don't want Facebook or Instagram or Twitter to own my relationship with my customer. I want to own that relationship. So they need to come to my website. They need to give me their email address or phone number so that I have the one-to-one -one relationship with them. If everything's run through Facebook or Instagram, I don't own that relationship. And that's gonna be detrimental to me, especially if Facebook decides to shut down my Facebook page tomorrow. Next is uh, stories. Stories are the uh, just like the format du jour for the last five years. 
<laughs> but ever since Snapchat uh, developed them, uh, we have seen stories continue to proliferate online. Uh, so we have Instagram stories and YouTube shorts and pretty much every platform, every social platform continues to push stories. They get the most billing, they get the most engagement with people who are following them on social. And so just pay attention to stories. Uh, you should be producing stories now and making sure that you're pushing those. If, if you're gonna produce only one type of content for social networks uh, in 2021, uh, stories would be it. And that would be inclusive of this new stories format. I put this here in social, but it actually ends up being not quite social. So this, this is the web stories in Google concept. So web stories are a new type of story format they are the same 1920 by 1080, uh, you know, um, formatted, uh, uh, you know, portrait images or videos, but they're actually created by you for search in Google. They're actually found in some place called Google Discover, basically mobile portions of, uh, you know, of users viewing Google products. That could be when I'm on an Android phone and I look at my news. It could be when I'm on an iOS device and I do a search on Google inside the Google app. Any number of those places, Google Web Stories is being utilized and it's also capable of being embedded in websites that are running on WordPress right now. Presumably we'll have more and more websites who support it, but right now if you have a WordPress website, you can embed Web Stories. I am incredibly bullish about the idea of web stories and so you should definitely check out web stories and see whether it's something that you can create for your business and generate some traffic to your website through the search engines uh continuing on in social just very quickly uh comments are where it's at today uh i don't care about your likes at all i care about the comments that are being made on your posts and this helps us understand sentiment analysis but the social networks their algorithms are preferring comments over likes now. So you really need to engage your audience to respond to things. You need to be able to incite a conversation. Don't incite a riot, but incite a conversation so that people are having those conversations on your content, because the more you can do that, the better. And of course, uh, we can always just like get rid of Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Facebook is still incredibly popular. It's not that Facebook is going away anytime soon. They bought Instagram to uh, stave off that uh, inevitable dev demise, and uh, they continue to reign as the largest social network. But we are seeing a huge uh, trend toward people actually leaving Facebook and going to what they call brand exclusive or paid communities. There are platforms like Mighty Networks, which happens to be one I really like, but people are in essence, instead of creating a Facebook group, they're going to these platforms where they can create their own branded space for their business where they can bring their audience. And so they can bring them there for free, where they can then start to nurture them toward sales, or they can charge out the gate, and that becomes a revenue source for them as well. Uh, this can include online courses, paid events, other kinds of engagement with our audiences in ways that we would not be or we would be a little bit more limited in doing on, say, a Facebook or a Twitter or otherwise. Next up uh, is uh, the podcasting world is kind of on fire right now. We have big corporate putting money into podcasting. And so just a quick note here that podcasting is seeing a huge renaissance. And uh, if you're into podcasting, let me know and I'm happy to answer any questions you have there. Next is that we have had a, a new entrant in the market. This is kind of weird because we went from, you know, basically text to image to video to live video to now a live audio uh, variant called social audio. And so now we have these platforms that are in, in instead of you going live on video, you're in essence going live by audio and then allowing people to interact and engage, come onto the quote unquote stage and interact with you in a live environment via audio only. And so this is going to continue to be something that we we see grow. We not only had Clubhouse come out of, out of the gate in 2020 during the pandemic, but now Twitter has uh, the, the Twitter spaces, Facebook is building their own platform, and many other platforms are adapting and adopting to the idea of social audio as being a core component of their platforms. And this, of course, dovetails very nicely into the podcast space. And so we're going to see more and more people having those two pieces blend together. And then, of course, we get to uh, our last trend, and that is the trend of virtual events. Uh, virtual events, of course, were the, the only types of events that were happening in 2020, but what we're seeing is that this is something that is not only 
a growing market, uh, notwithstanding Zoom fatigue and other kinds of virtual event fatigue, virtual events are here to stay. Uh, virtual experiences are here to stay. People want the convenience of these virtual events and virtual experiences. The differences are that a virtual event might be a webinar like this, but a virtual experience might be me say, I'm in Santiago, Chile, and I go live there and I walk you around to do a tour of the the area. Or I, um, I have a, a workshop where I show you how to make you know, pasta or something like that while I'm in Rome. Uh, those kinds of virtual experiences where you're interacting and engaging with the audience is a little bit different than virtual events where you are formally hosting event, an event. Uh, virtual experiences tend to be learning experiences. But we're also going to see the proliferation of hybrid events. And so hybrid events are certainly something that I think will be really, really interesting and powerful going forward. And the technology is now here. I've put some links to those technologies in the slides for you to be able to access. So all of these things are, are noted in the slides for you in that sense. And so uh, with that, um, just know that all the tools you can use, just for time purposes, I have placed a link if I pop out of here, you will see that there's a link to this document. And this document includes many of the tools I've, I've talked about, the specific tools that I've talked about the general idea of here in, uh, in the presentation. So that link will be there and shared with you uh, so that you can go ahead and access those tools that you can use. And so with that, um, let's hop into Q&A and then I can come back to my final thoughts. And so Deandra, do we have questions from folks? We do. Um, <clears throat> the first question, can you tell us about the paid ads on social media? Is it worth investing in? Oh, yes. OK, so here goes the deal. If your audience is there on that social network, then it's probably worth investing some ad dollars in it. It depends on your goal. And so if you're, if you're working top of the funnel or middle of the funnel, that's gonna be very different than bottom of the funnel, right? So top of the funnel is just awareness. Uh, middle of the funnel is people just getting to know you better. And then of course, bottom of the funnel is buy now, buy from me, do some kind of conversion. And what, we, what, I, what I tend to see is that depending upon the social network of, uh, that you're working on, say like LinkedIn, LinkedIn tends to be a top and middle funnel advertising tool. So that's a really great platform if you're trying to go B2B or B2C and you are trying to effectuate a, an awareness or a deepening of a relationship with a consumer. But it's not going to be a really great bottom of the funnel opportunity there. Twitter, great for brand awareness, great for conversion, for consumable, you know, consumer packaged goods, CPG. Um, and so we, we have top of the funnel and bottom of the funnel, but not really great for the middle stuff. So we just have to make sure we know the type of platform. So if you can give me a little bit more specifics, I can maybe answer those um, offline. I have my email address on the final slide, uh, but just know that absolutely social networks, you, it is now a pay to play environment. You have to put some level of digital ad budget into the business you know, uh, budget for the year, uh, figuring out how much you're gonna spend to both elevate posts because Facebook and really all of the other social networks now are you know, suppressing your exposure to the search engine by virtue of how much money you're putting into their platform. They basically want you to pay to be able to be seen by the largest uh, number of their users. That was actually <clears throat> along the lines of one of my questions, because I've heard a lot of businesses have trouble with the algorithms on Facebook showing up their content, even showing to the, their followers. Um, so you think it's more of a pay to play, like you said. Oh, absolutely. You know, Facebook yeah. has decided uh, above all of the other platforms, they have decided the most that they can squeeze money out of business owners. Uh, and uh, and so they've decided to start charging in this way by basically silencing your posts to people who have chosen to follow you. And of course, I think that's, you know, uh, not the greatest move. But uh, at yeah. the same time, uh, you know, they've chosen a business model. And that's what they're, they're going with that business model. So you know, you can't, you're not going to fight Facebook. Uh, so uh, the reality is, is that we do have to put some some digital ad dollars into the platform in order to be seen by our own followers, better yet growing our audience. And while I'm not really, uh, I'm not 
I'm not big on the idea that like, oh, you have to have 10 million followers and that kind of thing. That's all nonsense. Uh, the, the reality is, is that you have to be persuadable to the people who are following you, which means they need to see you often enough. So for example, like if I collected emails for 10 years, um, uh, you know, the, the reality is, is that if I never sent an email to that list over the course of the decade, and then, you know, one day I decided to send an email to them, most people won't remember me and won't want to interact with me. And the same thing applies with Facebook pages. If I'm posting every day, but nobody is, they follow me, but they are not receiving and seeing those posts, then when they do see a post from me, it's not going to be as resonant as if when I was actually boosting those posts or promoting those posts to my audience for them to see it on a regular basis. So Facebook has really just forced our hand in that regard. Right, right. <clears throat> um, can you illustrate how the new Google Web Stories works with web links? Oh yeah, so I can actually bring this up on screen. I was, uh, let's see here. Are you seeing my Web Stories page right now? No, we're still seeing okay. the PowerPoint. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring <laughs> this up here. Okay, so this yeah. is this is Web Stories, and this is gonna work with me. There we go. Uh, so if we go to the showcase, uh, so Web Stories is really really powerful, and so uh, this one I'll just use this as an example. Uh, and so what you get here is this stories format, and stories are unlike the social network stories. So social network stories, you have to have a certain number of followers, say on Instagram, in order to be able to put links in your content. You're not limited by that in Google Web Stories. You could put links here, you could put video, you could put calls to action. Uh, in essence, you're telling a story, right? And you can pan through. So once you open up a story, it takes over this full screen view. And in at least the WordPress plugin, you're capable of doing all of this inside of the WordPress installation. So you're doing all of this inside your website. You create your assets and you can put them in here. Uh, this was actually created with something called Newsroom, which allows you to create them in its own application also. Uh, but as you pan through each of the stories, you can overlay text, you can overlay stickers, and you can place links to content. So each of these things can be links to content, and they can be very visually stimulating and exciting and, and persuasive in their own way. So you can see here that they're actually telling you a story, showing you the different parts of how money is made. And obviously, when you get to the end here, they want you to, once we get there, uh, there we go. Um, so let me go back. So once we get to the end of the story, oh, I seem to have gotten myself. Uh, let's see if we can get to the end again. So we get to the end and of course, they have a call to action, which is this tap to subscribe button, right? So tap to subscribe to their newsletter. So they have done a, a, the job of basically um, putting together a story and then they say, okay, well, now that we've provided you with enough value, would you be willing to subscribe to our newsletter? And so we have this very strong power within Google Web Stories to do that. And so we can place links, we can do all kinds of fun things in that regard. And so that's the, that's the nature and the feel of Web Stories and the, uh, you, like I said, you can link and you're not controlled by anyone with regard to the number or the ways in which you can link. Google has given us some best practices to follow with regard to the development of web stories so that you're not doing you know, anything that's gonna cause people to have a really bad experience. So making sure things are legible, making sure that you're not overlinking, that kind of thing. But otherwise you have a lot of power with the transitions and the way in which web stories really appear for you. Uh, so my question is along those lines, I know you had mentioned that there are different communities uh, be because Facebook is becoming a little difficult, difficult with the algorithms and having to pay. Um, you know, you mentioned communities like Mighty Networks. Um, how do you get, like a lot of small businesses are using Facebook. So how would you get your audience over to a new platform or try to get them to Google Stories or something, you know, along those lines? Absolutely. So it's all about value, right? Am I, am I providing enough value to get you to come to be where I want you to be? And so we've learned over the past 20 years that lead magnets work, what I call a valuable downloadable asset that work last first word being value. Value means 
you're willing to do what I want you to do because you perceive the value of what I'm giving to you to be high enough for you to want to do that action. And so uh, value is important here. And so when we know that somebody will be willing to give up their email address in order to get access to something, then we want to do that same thing when it comes to a brand exclusive or a paid community. What's the value you're gonna provide for people for them to leave Facebook and come to someplace else? It's a high ask, but ultimately it's actually a really important one. So for example, if somebody is willing to pay me a dollar for the same thing that otherwise they could get for free by searching the internet, that tells you something about that person, right? They value their time, you know, they're willing to pay for something that they find to be valuable. And that's important data that we can use in our business. If we just continue to give things away for free as business owners, we just tend to devalue our assets like what do we have to offer if all we do is give away things for free and so we have to ask of our communities something some entry fee and if that entry fee is is work labor that is you need to leave facebook and come to this other place to access what i have to offer that's of higher value than what i provide on facebook then that tells you about that person is highly interested in whatever topic of interest they've chosen by virtue of joining your community. And we have to consistently remember that, that there are a lot of moochers. There are people who are just consuming for the sake of consuming, right? We have this vast World Wide Web with content that you can possibly consume in 10 lifetimes. But the people who you want to come and interact with your business are people who care enough about what you have to offer and are willing to at least come to your community in order to be able to gain access to that information and then ultimately that they are have a potential to buy like i don't want 10,000 people coming to my community who are all people who just want free information and never want to purchase anything i need a standard to be able to be set and everybody's on facebook so that bar is very low for them to join a facebook group but for them to leave and join something like a Mighty Networks requires them to actually have some, some thought there. And to pay, for example, for joining a community is an even higher level, right? It's not just about diversifying revenue sources because that's a, that's a legitimate business case as well. But I, I find it to be actually that the people who join your communities off Facebook or off you know, other platforms on your own tend to be much more loyal and they tend to buy more. So why wouldn't I want to invest my time and energy in that group of people? Yeah, that's great. That's a great point. And I think that's something that, you know, uh, for our businesses, if you want some ideas, how do you bring that value, um, you know, to your business to have people leave and go to another network? Um, that's something that we can help you out with at, at the SBDC. So that was great. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think we've We've covered all the questions, Ray. If you have any additional thoughts or anything um, to wrap up. Sure. So I, I just have a couple of final thoughts for everybody in terms of thinking through the data that we talked about at the beginning in terms of really technology trends. As we see more people go mobile, more people purchasing online, we, we should think through how we actually make some of these changes. One is, of course, we are still in a dynamic situation. You know, the the, the floor is, is moving from underneath us as business owners, and we need to be flexible and adaptive in that. So don't start making any hard and fast long-term uh, choices that are going to lock you into things. Uh, the other side is that if you were for some reason doing, uh, you know, takeout services as a restaurant, or you were doing, uh, you know, uh, you know, curbside, uh, you know, checkout for folks in your retail store, continue to do those things. Consumers like the convenience. So pandemic or not, you are capable of selling more by giving greater convenience to users. They want shipping, they want local delivery, they want those aspects of things. So stay flexible and adaptive and your competitors are likely to take the path of least resistance and will stop doing those things. If you continue doing those things, you will be available and alive and well and flourishing uh, the next time you come to a webinar in 2022 <laughs> with me, right? Like you are more likely to stay in business if you continue to stay flexible and adaptive in this uh, changing market. Next up is this is absolutely the time to touch base with your SBDC, talk to your advisors about your existing buyer personas, your existing customer journey maps, and your sales funnels. They, they have changed. And, uh, and so uh, they will change again. And this is a really good time to figure out, like, are buyers now 
who are your ideal buyers, those people that you really think are your ideal buyers, what are the new components that are really working into their buying choices? And where are they navigating in order to make those choices? And ultimately, how can you help them follow through to purchase better? This is the time to talk to your SBDC, get the advice you need to be able to make that stuff happen. And finally, I, I consistently say this, like ads are for right now, right? If I put out ads, they should be good enough to bring in dollars and new business through the funnel very quickly, but they are not a long-term strategy. Uh, you need to be able to build your content so that you have a, a, um, a, a mechanism for being able to bring people over the long-term to your website and then helping facilitate them toward a sale without the need to have to consistently stoke the fire of the advertising search engines. All it is is just taking more and more of your money. And as I said, we absolutely do need to have an ad budget now when it comes to social networking, uh, but we can create effective content marketing where that over the long term, it actually competes with our advertising in such a way that we may be able to diminish or you know reduce or diminish to some extent so that it's negligible and we're really doing an effective amount of business just from our content marketing. So those are my final thoughts. Uh, if anybody has any questions, my email address is available. I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, from today. And like I said, there the slides contain more resources embedded in it. There were lots of slides I skipped. So there are there are, you know, resources to each of those various areas of trends in the slides. And then there is this handout that is also embedded in uh, the slides as well. Well, thank you. That is we really appreciate you, you know, giving all these resources, going through all this information. I mean, um, you're obviously an expert in this area, so we uh, we really appreciate you spending time with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, so everyone, like we said, we you will get an email with a link to the recording. Uh, you'll get an evaluation and you'll get all of the slides with the links, um, all of the information, the handout, all of that will be sent to you in an email. Um, if you'd like to sign up for upcoming webinars, you can visit us at virginiasbdc.org slash training. Um, the next webinar in this series, Supply Chain Impacts and Considerations, is on June 23rd, so be sure to check that one out and sign up for it. Also on our website is the COVID Business Recovery Center, which we developed to help owners not only continue business operations, but to thrive and recover. These resources are designed to be used in collaboration with your local SBDC advisors, and you can sign up for a free and confidential session by emailing help at virginiasbdc.org or you can visit our website and register there as well. Well, thank you so much everyone for attending. We hope to see you on the 23rd and have a great rest of your day.